So we're going to talk to you about complementary and alternative medicine. You might imagine that we have a couple of strong opinions about that topic. <laughs> uh, we'll try to share them with you. I, I noticed the slide's already gone up there. <laughs> um, oh. <laughs> so that's our colleague, Mark Chrislip, uh, who wasn't here. In the, and now, for those of you, he, he seems to like a little bit of fancy words. So the next slide. Um, just for those who don't know what instantiate means. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, so yeah, so we're going to talk about cow pies today. Um, but first, just to, by way of introduction, uh, Harriet Hall is a, a retired physician who blogs for us at Science-Based Medicine. Uh, David Gorski is the managing editor of Science-Based Medicine blog, and even for years before that, runs his own blog, Respectful Incidents, where he blogs under the name of ORAC. And Rachel Dunlop is very active in the science-based medicine movement or opposing alternative medicine in Australia and internationally. So welcome to my esteemed panel. <laughs> so we're, we're going to talk to you uh, during, at this panel about complementary and alternative medicine. We actually try really hard not to let that frame the discussion or frame the debate. That's why you know, we chose the name science-based medicine. We want to be pro or for something. We are promoting a scientific standard in medicine. But complementary and alternative medicine, or CAM, which is pretty much what we're going to call it for the rest of the panel, just for, for convenience, um, it, you know, is a, a social cultural phenomenon now, legal even, and uh, it has infiltrated not only into regulation, but also into academia. Um, so we have to confront it. We have to confront the concept the, the meme, if you will, of what is CAM. So I'm going to start uh, with that question for my panel, starting uh, to my left with Harriet. Can you just define, in, in your mind, what is CAM? Well, there's no such thing as alternative medicine. It's a myth. And uh, it, there, there can be alternatives within medicine, for instance, surgery versus medical treatment for coronary heart disease. And there can be alternatives to medicine, like not treating at all. But there, is, there can be no alternative to medicine itself. There's just medicine that's been adequately tested and proven to work and medicine that hasn't. And when it's been proven to work, it becomes part of conventional medicine. Yeah, that, that <coughs> is actually almost a direct quote from Marcia Angel. I don't know if that was intentional, from uh, the New England Journal of Medicine from, oh, I think, 10 years ago or something like that now, maybe eight, eight or nine years ago. There is no alternative. It's, it's either science-based medicine or it's not. Dave, you want to right. add to Obviously, I agree with Harriet, but I would sort of add well, there are actually three types of medicine. Medicine that has been shown to work, medicine that hasn't been shown to work, and medicine that's been shown not to work. So, and CAM is mostly the latter two. Medicine that has either hasn't been shown to work or has been shown not to work. Um, and, that, you know, the whole term complementary and alternative medicine is basically a more of a marketing buzzword than anything else that it, it, you know back 20 30 years ago it used to be called alternative medicine and over time they decided that they didn't like you know alternative implied that it was inferior it was outside the mainstream which of course it was um, and they, they so they came up I don't know who came up with this term but complementary and alternative they're like okay, it will complement medicine. You use it with regular medicine, which leads to Mark Chrislip's quote, because the, the latest buzz term, buzzword is integrative medicine. Right, integrating CAM into regular medicine. Or as I say, integrating quackery in, with real medicine. Right. Rachel? Yeah, I don't really have a lot more to add than what my colleagues have said, but I think uh, many people in this audience would know the famous Tim Minchin line that he's used in Storm, the video, which is alternative medicine that's been shown to work is called medicine. And there's no alternative to that, that's it. Medicine that works is medicine, there's nothing else. <coughs> so then is the, is the category, complementary and alternative medicine, a legitimate category? Harriet? No. <laughs> no. No. Okay. All right. So then, how did the category originate? It, it, I don't think it originated from within mainstream medicine as something that 
Uh, it didn't arise organically out of, of categorizing different types of treatments or, or an, uh, an approach. It, it, it had a specific history to it. So we'll, let me start with you, David, actually. Tell, how, did, how did the whole CAM phenomenon begin? Well, I, I mean, it, it, it's one of those things um, that, that it, it was basically, like I said, a, mar a more of a marketing uh, vehicle. It, it complementary and alternative is, by, by calling it complementary, you, you're basically saying, well, we're not saying you shouldn't use conventional medicine, but this could complement it. Yeah. Um, and, and then they, you know, complementary and alternative, add it together, it's a nice little acronym, CAM, easy to remember, easy to, you know, sell. Now, I, I, of course, interestingly enough, the, a lot of practitioners who are pushing integrative medicine don't like the term CAM anymore because they don't like the fact that it has alter ha having something that is complementary to medicine to them implies that it's inferior which it is but uh, it, it, but they don't want but calling it integrative they now can sell it as oh we're integrating the best of both worlds and it, it elevates this these you know unscientific methods you know at least in the public eye as being co-equal with conventional medicine and you know it, that that more than anything, it's it's about language. It's about branding yeah. and and marketing. Right. Yeah. And, and I mean, I, I wrote a post a few months ago because I came across this uh, this CAM website where the guy was saying NCAM should be renamed to the National Center, you know, for Integrative Medicine. No, don't use CAM. Use Integrative Medicine. Um, and for basically. The reasons that you know, I said you know, alternative implies inferior. You know, and our colleague uh, Wally Sampson, who's who's uh, been doing this a lot longer than we have, uh, he comes right out and says before the term CAM and integrated, before all these new marketing rebranding terms were were around, it was called health fraud. <laughs> or, or quackery. Yeah, or quackery, which has a legal problem right, to it. Right. There, there's a couple of, unfortunately, you know, if I uh, use the term quackery, that you're opening yourself up to libel. Some of our colleagues in Europe were successfully sued for calling a quack a quack, which is unfortunate. But just saying it's health fraud, I mean, that was, that was what it was called. And, uh, but then they managed to completely change that around to essentially they, the, the promoters of health fraud said, okay, we're going to brand this as alternative and complementary, integrative, whatever, and it, um, it, 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 in a way it worked. Yeah, it did. Yeah. But isn't that what Mark Chrislip, Mark Chrislip is quite um, upfront about this, Steve, doesn't he call it a scam, supplementary, complementary, alternative oh, medicine? Or, or so-called complementary and alternative medicine. So-called <laughs> complementary and alternative medicine. Right. You know, Wally Sampson tried to pin down the, the first usage of the term alternative medicine. I don't think he ever figured out, he was trying to find when it was first mentioned in the medical literature, but it wasn't until sometime around 1970 that the term uh, came along. Before that, we call these things quackery and folk medicine and all kinds of other terms. Right. But everything got lumped together under alternative medicine. It includes herbal medicine, which is somewhat plausible because that's where pharmacology came from. Mm. And it includes things like drinking your own urine and sticking candles in your ears. So <laughs> it, uh, it uh, put a lot of different things into one bag very inappropriately. Right. And it wasn't until uh, after 1990 that the terms complementary and, and integrative yeah. medicine came into common use. So it's really a recent phenomenon. Yeah, and that's a very interesting point, Harriet, because we get are often asked about CAM, and the, the category is so broad, mm -hmm. it's hard to make sweeping statements about it, except for the fact that it's, it's everything that's not science-based medicine. Um, so it's really de defined by what it isn't. But the, the, David, maybe you could talk a little bit about this too. What's the spectrum that we see under this broad umbrella of CAM? Oh, you, you have everything from like what Harriet said, you know, drinking your own urine or homeopathy, Reiki, which is, uh, by the way, nothing more than faith healing uh, using Eastern mysticism instead of Christianity as its basis, um, to supplements and various herbal medicines. Now, we always make the point that, you know, herbal medicines and supplements might actually have physiological effects. They, they, they do, after all, often contain drugs. They may be like adulterated, impure drugs with, you know, who knows what their potency is, but, you know, they're, they're drugs and there's some plausibility. And there's a whole field in pharmacology 
of natural products, you know, natural product pharmacology, which is science and some of our most important drugs, in, for instance, in oncology have come out of it. Like Taxol comes from the bark, was originally uh, derived from the bark of the Pacific yew tree. So you do kind of have to, you know, distinguish the various forms of medicine that fall under CAM. Um, as some of them are somewhat plausible, but those don't need a separate category. It's, it, once again, if they test out scientifically, then they just become medicine. Yeah, one of our colleagues, actually I'm forgetting which one, said that it's the, the spectrum is from the barely plausible to the demonstrably absurd. Uh, that was Kimball. That was Kimball, yeah, those great terms. That, that, that pretty much captures it. Um, so, but what's the effect of it being so inclusive? Is that something that works in their favor or in our favor in terms of you know, the public opinion about CAM? The fact that the, the category, this false marketing category, includes things like homeopathy, which break the laws of science, you know, physics and chemistry, let alone you know, biology and medicine, including that with things that are plausible and reasonable but just need to be studied scientifically, like uh, like herbalism, for example, and even beyond that, I would add they, they try to they're constantly trying to include under this umbrella things which are already part of science based medicine, like nutrition right. and exercise right. and anything to do with you know, with like right. physical exercise therapy exercise or, or nutrition or, of course, their version of nutrition it, it only resembles science based <coughs> nutrition by coincidence sometimes but yeah. well there's like, there's yeah there's science based nutrition and pseudoscientific nutrition but they try to include the science based stuff and rebrand it as cam so it seems that they're trying to make the whole category legitimate by including legitimate end of the spectrum yeah it's, it's a huge umbrella and people totally. can find something that they believe in and that lends credibility to all the rest of it well you know i i believe in uh, X and uh, so all that other stuff. Uh, if right. it, if it's the same category, maybe I should start believing in homeopathy and some of those other right. things. It's the tr I call it the Trojan horse. Okay, you have the tro the Trojan horse is like nutrition, you know, lifestyle interventions, you know, maybe a few plausible herbal medicines, and they, and they pull the Trojan horse inside academia, which is another topic entirely how this has infiltrated academia and then all the woo comes out you know once it's well that was farther down my list but since you bring it up David and you've written a lot about this why don't you tell us about how they how camp proponents have infiltrated to what extent and with what strategies have they infiltrated academia oh <laughs> well there are now many medical first off there are many medical schools that now have either you know, division sections, uh, you know, departments of integrative medicine. Um, and these include big names, Harvard, Yale, unfortunately, um, Stanford, uh, you know, and basically, you know, they, it's, they've been, re under this rebranding, there's, they've managed to give the impression of some scientific uh, legitimacy. And there's now, you know, two, there's a large, you know, we have an, the National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine, which, you know, is funding grants to study this stuff. We have the Bravewell Consortium, which is funding grants and various programs to promote um, CAM, for want of a better term. So there's a lot of money in it for medical right. schools. They're basically given money to... Right. set up a center for complementary and alternative medicine. Yeah, I mean, the same thing is happening in Australia, yeah. but um, to an extent, it's it's driven mainly by the fact that unis are going broke. Like, we don't have, they don't have a lot of funding anymore. And in our case, there's a lot of money in China um, <coughs> that they're throwing at unis to establish traditional Chinese medicine clinics. In fact, only last month, um, a university in Adelaide set up a facility guided by the vice chancellor um, because they're getting a lot of money thrown at them. But Australian skeptics recently did a, a very um, large amount of research looking at the amount of um, quackery or CAM that's in universities in Australia. And we found that about two thirds have some sort of um, alternative medicine. And some of the stuff is just nuts. Like um, Tim Mendham, who's our executive officer, is here, and Joe Benamu did this research. He found that there was an electri electrical engineering course that was teaching auras. Oh. Mm. I mean, 
that, okay, that's not a medical course specifically, but um, also there was a homeopathic midwifery. I'm not quite sure how that works. But it, it went from things like um, chiropractic. Um, Is that you just push a little bit? Is that how that <laughs> The less you push, I don't know. The less you push, the more effective it is. But, you know, we've started a campaign in Australia that some of you here, I think, are actually signatories to. It's called Friends of Science in Medicine. And that rose out of this research that we did. Um, and it's, it was spearheaded by Loretta Marin. And it's basically just a bunch of people and academics who are concerned about the infiltration of, of CAM into universities. And we've got something now like 400 signatories to this, just saying to, it's, it's really designed to <coughs> highlight this and to indicate to vice chancellors and chancellors that this stuff should not be in science-based courses. Um, I mean, one of the things that was particularly um, bad about this and insidious was there was a chiropractic um, clinic at the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology that was specifically treating babies. So they were cracking babies' necks in this clinic. And of course, there's no evidence that that does anything apart from possibly harm them. Um, and so there was a big campaign created by Australian skeptics about that. And fortunately, one of the universities has um, scaled back some of their CAM, but we're up against the fact that there's a lot of money from, from CAM um, proponents who are, who are it's flowing into universities and as government funding is pulling out, they're in a, in a bind. I, I found some interesting ahead. statistics online. They, they said that 60% of US medical schools teach some form of CAM, and in Europe it was 40%. I also found a study of Danish medical students that was kind of scary. Uh, they said that, um, let's see, 68% of the medical students in Denmark had used some kind of CAM, and most of that fortunately, was herbal medicine, vitamins, and things like that. But what was chilling to me is that 18% of the medical students in Denmark had used reflexology. Hmm. <clears throat> I actually was thinking, I, I might be able to top what your examples. Um, <laughs> <Damn>. <laughs> and sadly, it, and sadly, I hate to do it because it, it's my alma mater. Um, University of Michigan has a section of uh, anthroposophic medicine. That's Rudolf Steiner. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, you know, this it brings up the question of, and the Friends of Science and Medicine is a good example of of scientists and, and science-based physicians banding together and saying, this is wrong, this shouldn't be happening, we need to maintain a standard of science within the field of medicine. But why, does it, why isn't that happening more? Why isn't the scientific and medical community in an uproar or an outrage over the infiltration of blatant pseudoscience into medicine? David, you want to start with that? <laughs> He's no, being no, a shruggy. Are you being Val, a shruggy? Val Jones coined a term a few years back, the shruggy, which basically is, yeah, they think it, they realize it's nonsense, but they just don't care enough to do anything about it. It's and and quite frankly, and another thing is, most physicians are not really scientists. I mean, I hate to say this, being one, but you know, I learned that this is true from having you know done a PhD as well as an MD. They don't necessarily always recognize what's good science and what's not without some help. Yeah, I want to add to that because um, there was a department in a university that I can't name where they were teaching anatomy to chiropractic students. And when the academics went and complained to the vice chancellor, they were told that because they were teaching that course, they were getting tens of thousands of dollars in the kitty, which they could then spend on their research if they didn't have any money. So they were sort of in a bind of, well, if we, don't, if we stop teaching anatomy to chiropractic students, we won't be able to fund our labs. So they just kept doing it. Yeah, do you want anything here, Eric? I just wanted to say that I think some medical doctors don't really understand what the CAM people are claiming. But they, they've heard of right. it. Uh, one of their friends used it. It sounded like a good idea. And they don't have the time or the interest to really understand what it's all oh, about. Oh, absolutely. For instance, and I'm sure you encountered this. Most people and a lot of doctors think that homeopathy is just herbal medicine. Yeah, and most pharmacists too. That's Sorry, Paul. And, and so I, when I actually explain it to them, you know, like in, in, or I give a talk explaining it in gory detail and you know, like comparing the dilution to like the number of atoms in the known universe and stuff like that, and they're, they're like, really? You know? <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean, I, I have confronted my colleagues about this a lot, and you hear things like, you know, what's the harm, or it's all just faith healing, and there's always going to be this in medicine, so why bother? And Or, or you know, this is just, you know, make, making patients feel better. It's like the touchy-feely, benign intervention, so let them let do it. Uh, and there is a complete lack of understanding of how the rank pseudoscience that it represents. It, I, I mean, yeah, and that... And that, that part, whenever I hear that, I say, so you're basically saying that to be, have a good bedside manner and, you know, make our patients trust and like us and, you know, treat them with respect that we have to embrace quackery? <laughs> right. But they don't, I guess they don't think about it as, as quackery, which... Okay, okay, or that we have to abandon science? Right. <laughs> yeah, so again, we understand that that's what it is, but there, I find... I mean, is this the same in Australia, do you think, Rachel, that this, it's not, it's amazing how little our colleagues know about pseudoscience yeah. and medicine. I mean, it's like what Jamie was saying yesterday, that there's the consumer protection organisations that don't have the, the skills and expertise to understand this stuff, and then there's the scientists who don't have the knowledge about the, the quackery and the, the tricks that people can, right. can pull on people. So we're the guys in the middle that it's our obligation to explain this stuff to people. And I work with plenty of scientists, and our job is to critically analyse data and come up with evidence for an effect. And so many of my colleagues don't know that homeopathy is bunk and I've had people tell me that I should leave people alone and acupuncture works and they don't know how, but it works. So you know, within, within medicine we have what we like to call a standard of care. Um, you can't just do anything and call it medicine. And the traditional method for determining what the standard of care is involves something to do with scientific evidence. We call it a science-based standard of care. It, you know, in my mind, CAM represents an erosion, if not a full frontal assault, on the science-based standard of care. So, Harriet, why don't you discuss that a little bit further? How, sh how should we have a standard of care, and how does, that, how does CAM relate to that? Well, we should have a standard of care, definitely, but the, uh, the devil is in the details. When you try to uh, define a standard of care and implement it, there, there's one big problem with that in that science is constantly changing. So if you try to have a, a, a cookbook or a dogmatic standard of care, things are going to change, and there is a, a chance that uh, somebody could be... Uh, sued for not following a standard of care when actually he was following better, more, more recent evidence that just hadn't developed into the standard yet. But we have to have standards. I mean, uh, the lawyers couldn't, couldn't do their job uh, in malpractice suits if they couldn't say that the doctor had failed to follow the standard of care. Right, so the standard of care is a bit fluid, is what you're saying. They yes. maybe exploit that in order to work it in around the edges. Yes. I think it's worse than that, though. Did, did you want to... Um, Talk about that, David. Well, no, no, I'm just, we have, you know, it's actually a fairly recent phenomenon that's going on, is our ev evidence-based guidelines that are being, you know, issued by various professional societies. We have a ton of them in oncology, and we, in particular, where I work, we try to follow the, N the NCCN guidelines, which the National um, Consort, I forget, uh, Cancer Center um, Network or something. But it's, a, it's an organization that puts out these guidelines, and if you, you should see the, one for breast, the ones for breast cancer. It's like, you know, pages and pages. Um, and they update them like every year or sometimes multiple times a year. Um, do you think that, uh, this is, could be Rachel or any of you, do you think that CAM represents a double standard within medicine rather than not only an erosion of the existing standard? Well, I guess it represents a double standard in the sense that they want to be, they want to be, they want to play with the big boys, if you like. They want yeah. to be in the white coats and they want to have the stethoscopes and they want to have evidence behind them, but they don't want to follow the rules, you know. Mm. So they don't want to have to prove efficacy or safety, but they want to be up there with the drugs that have gone through, you know, phase four clinical trials and cost billions of dollars to, to get to that stage. They want to have that legitimacy without following the rules. And practitioners of CAM do that all the time. Mm -hmm. They don't want to be regulated, they don't want to be controlled, but they want to be, they want to play with the big boys. So let's talk about those rules. Uh, you're talking about the rules of how scientific evidence relates to the practice of medicine, how we interpret scientific evidence. And again, that's been my experience as well. They, want, they don't want to play by the rules of science. 
Uh, and David, like you talk about uh, like the Trojan horse, we've written right. about the bait and switch. Tell us a little bit more about that. Well, I mean, basically, they they want a short, you know, they want a shortcut, you know, the the whole process, and you know, essentially reach approval of their methods or you know acceptance of their methods in the medical community without doing the hard and dirty work that it takes to get to that stage. Um, you know, to get a treatment to the point where it's accepted in medicine is usually a pretty long process that it can, it, it can either start with a clinical observation, then it involves lab work, and then, you know, back to the clinic for more clini for clinical trials that start out small, like pilot studies, and then work their way up to large phase three studies. And they like, they want to jump straight to the phase three a lot of times. <laughs> And, and do them, and they tend to do them badly enough that you know placebo effects often make it, you know, can often make it seem as though they have some evidence that their stuff might work. This in acupuncture, this is you know. So, you, so in fact, you there was the, what you said. Um, oh, the, how they they go back to lesser trials. Uh, the, 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 right, right, the, right. Yeah. So. Um, there are a certain hierarchy of clinical evidence that we use right. to decide what works and what doesn't work, what should be part of the standard of care. And when the best studies show that, for example, acupuncture doesn't work, I found that I've written about this, they do one of two things. They reinterpret the study to say that it does work by essentially uh, rebranding placebo effects as a real effect. Or they say, okay, forget that. We're going to go to less well-controlled, less rigorous trials because they're more pragmatic or real-world experience, and we're going to use that data. So essentially trials that were never designed to be efficacy trials, we're gonna use them to prove, quote unquote, or demonstrate efficacy because the efficacy trials are coming out negative. And again, that's definitely a double standard because they're, they're yeah. not playing by the rules. Yeah, I had an, um, a, a little fun with a homeopath recently, <coughs> um, just before I came to TAM, and he's quite, apparently quite famous for trolling in the UK. But I think, the panel is familiar with the Shang study from The Lancet. Was it The Lancet? 2005? Um, which was, it was published. It was a meta-analysis of whether homeopathy works. And they chose about 12 different studies and looked at the overall body of evidence, which is the best way to determine if there's a real effect. And they found that there was no difference between the homeopathic treatment and placebo. But within those were six studies that were positive. But when you compared them to the rest of the studies that were negative, you got, a, you know, an answer of zero. But this guy was going and picking out the positive studies from that meta-analysis and saying, but look, they're positive, therefore homeopathy works. Yeah. He was undoing the meta-analysis. He was undoing the meta-analysis <laughs> to get a positive effect, well, yeah. Well, and there will always be seemingly positive studies that, you know, like cl clinical trial. there's noise in clinical trials. We choose a certain statistical significance level. There will always be false positives. You have to look at the, you know, the, you know, the, in the entire body of evidence. Right. What really kills me is when they admit that there's no good evidence to back their method, for instance, acupuncture. There have been acupuncturists that have said, well, yes, the literature doesn't really support it, but uh, we, we want to keep doing it for the placebo effect. Well, that's obviously a double standard because what if a pharmaceutical company had a new drug and they did a study <laughs> and compared it to the placebo and found that the placebo and the drug worked equally well? <laughs> I mean, it would never get on the market. They're not, they're, not, uh, they're not able to sell a drug because it might have a placebo effect. So the double standard is just glaringly obvious there. So that's sort of the scientific double standard. They're trying to have rules just for themselves. And they want to write them as they go along to suit the evidence, rebranding placebo effects, using the wrong kinds of studies. But there's also um, a legal double standard that, that they are very aggressively pushing. In, in my experience, it's largely under the banner of healthcare freedom. And in fact, there are healthcare freedom laws <laughs> um, in just many states. I just the road a couple days ago yeah. with that, right? Yeah. Right. So tell us about that, David. Yeah, okay. Health freedom, healthcare freedom. It's basically what I like to, ca I like to call health freedom freedom for quacks from pesky government interference, <laughs> which is basically what it is. Yeah. Uh, you know, they want to, but they brand it under, well, you should have the right to choose your health care. I'm like, okay, you have the right to choose your financial instruments too, so does that mean Bernie Madoff shouldn't be in jail? <laughs> right. 
So yeah, they, they brand it as, <laughs> they brand it as consumer freedom, but it's really the freedom of the seller right. to not be restricted by standards of care. Right. Yeah, there's, there's a current fight going on in Australia with the anti-vaxxers because um, there's a product that you may have heard of called Black Salve, and it's basically a paste, and it's, um, it's caustic and it's supposed to cure cancer. So obviously David would know about it. it. And yeah, <laughs> basically it burns holes in your face. And um, Quack Watch has written a whole page about it where someone applied it to the side of their nose and ended up with half a nose because it's a caustic paste. And so for that reason, it's banned by our regulators. But the um, Australian Vaccination Network has decided that that is against their health freedom. So they keep going on um, radio and talking about how we should be able to buy it and use it because it cures cancer, and they keep getting told off by the regulators, and they keep saying, but it's our health freedom. Yeah, as a, as a, I could never understand the, the black salve as a cancer surgeon. Oh, okay, yeah, you could cure some skin cancers by burning them off, but it, it's, it'd burn them off in an uncontrolled fashion, leave a horrendous wound, Instead of cutting them off, which is what we do. I know, but it's you know, not. It's, it's, <laughs> but you see, what you don't understand is that it has an innate intelligence, apparently, David. So it can oh, choose oh, the that, yeah, it, it can really? choose the cancer cells selectively. <laughs> it doesn't burn. It all doesn't the, just burn your no, skin. No, 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 no. It's smart. It's Isn't that like <laughs> acid? <laughs> That's what I've heard from the health freedom people. Yeah, it, it, there's also um, I think an analogy to be made with acad with academic freedom calls, say for creationists, say. Yeah that they, it's the same thing, they say, yeah. we want academic freedom to teach pseudoscience in science classrooms, and again, it's the, the um, conflict with the standard of, the academic standard, you know. So we say, well, there should be some minimal standards in terms of academic legitimacy or uh, science-based medicine, and they are, are countering that by saying, no, but we, but we want f academic freedom, freedom of speech, freedom, healthcare freedom, Want to add to that, Harry? Oh, vaccines tie in here too because uh, parents say they, they don't want the government telling them what to do with their children. They want the, the freedom to treat their children with their parental wisdom. Yeah, so the, the uh, parental freedom oh, also oh, comes yeah, in. Yeah, totally. It's the whole. It's the same thing. You know, they, yeah. Like the, at your debate a couple of days ago, yeah. what was the last question? Should oh, yeah, vaccines the, be mandated? Should vaccines be mandated? And that was the one where the audience says, we want to hear your answer to this. Like when the conversation was getting a little bit away from it, they, that was their, the thing they were most interested in. Was, I just want to add one thing, yeah. Steve. I mean, freedom of, of speech and freedom of health is, doesn't um, mean that you don't have freedom from responsibility. Right. And I think that's the point here is that these people want freedom from, from liability and responsibility. So they're quite happy to go and spruik things like black salve, but they're not under the same regulations and legislation that science-based people are. So if you, David, went and used that on one of your patients, you'd probably be struck off or you'd be, you know, you'd be disciplined for that. There would be, there would be consequences. There would be problems and trouble. <coughs> yeah, but these people want freedom from having to apply the laws of science and then freedom from actually having to, to take the consequences. And in many cases, they don't have to because there's no legislative bodies to crack down on them. And people may remember um, the homeopath Francine Scrayan, who was involved in um, treating a woman who died from untreated colon cancer. Now, that went to the courts and it went through the coroner and they deemed that she did play a role in that. However, she's still practicing now. And in science-based medicine, that would never happen. And you know, I'd point out that, they, they're, again, I said there are actual healthcare freedom laws in many states in the United States. And I've personally been involved in cases where we proved in court that a physician was practicing below the standard of care. I mean, significantly enough that they were, what they were doing was malpractice and needed to be disciplined. They were disciplined. And then they, they appealed on the basis that what they were doing was alternative. And under the state's, you know, freshly minted uh, healthcare freedom law, that they were immune to the standard of care. Oh, oh. Yeah, that North, was the North, that was the rule. Yeah, yeah. Is, this isn't Rashid Buttar. Well, that's one case, but I was Rashid also involved Buttar with another case. Was, yeah. You know what he did? He has a very powerful political organization in North Carolina. He's he's a doc, He's basically a doctor who practices, you know, alternative medicine, and he. It treats, he used, used to treat cancer. He was big in the autism world because he used chelation therapy and all these other, you know, quote unquote, biomedical uh, treatments for autism. So basically, when the state medical board started coming after him, he managed to get his 
buddies in the legislature to pass a law that basically was like one of these health freedom laws, right. and then he's off the hook. Yeah, can you legalize my crime so I don't get yeah. held accountable for it? Thanks, guys. I, I, I want to leave some uh, time for questions, uh, for questions and answers. I think it's always the most interesting aspect of this topic. Um, but so, George, while I'm going to ask each of my panelists one final question, and while we're doing that, maybe you could start the process of lining people up for questions. So, the final question I'm going to ask of each of you, I'll start, Rachel, with you, is if you were all powerful dictator of the world, what yes. steps would you take? So if you, if you could just say, I want to institute these steps to protect the public from health fraud, to minimize the damage of CAM, what, what, what would you do? What steps would you take? Yeah, well, I'd take steps to try to, I guess, delegitimize it. And in many cases, at least in Australia, and I, it's probably the same in the US, um, a lot of quackery or CAM is included in um, private health insurance. So when you sign up to pay to get health cover, you're also paying for things like chiro, homeopathy, um, aromatherapy, crystal therapy. Uh, and in fact, there have been moves in Australia very recently um, to actually cut that from private health. Um, because the, currently the situation is the government supplements the health funds. And so they, in an indirect manner, they're paying for that. Mm -hmm. So that potentially is going to be removed from Australian health funds, which is fantastic news. Um, and then I would also just slap the media around the face and upside the head. <laughs> because honestly, I, you know, anyone who watches sort of current affairs magazine type Oprah TV shows, there's just, they're so gullible and they do so much damage because there's still evidence to show that most of us are exposed to that and a lot of us get our, <coughs> our health reporting from watching the mainstream media. And they just swallow everything whole and spit it out as if it, it all works. And I think that's where I just go, that's it, slap upside the head, stop it. Okay, David? If, if you add Dr. Oz to that, I'll... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'll slap him upside I, the head. <laughs> and what has, to, what has to happen is that the various medical boards, you know, in the U.S., each state has its own medical board, but other countries have, you know, country, medical boards. It's all... It, it's, it's all you know done in different ways everywhere, but whatever, however they do it, the medical boards have to have act more actual power, more actual yeah. um, ability to discipline doctors, more actual basis in science. A lot of what medical boards do is not to enforce the standard of care; it's to get do it's to go after doctors and, and appropriately so who are like. Um, Dependent on you know substance dependence, you know alcoholism, or who are diddling patients or something like that, it, it, and yes, they need to be go. You know that is their priority because those are very easily demonstrable dangers to public health if you let that doctor continue to uh, practice. But at the, often there's no energy left to go after you know these doctors practicing various uh, what we consider various things that we consider quackery. So the first step is, you know, the medical boards have to be much strengthened. A lot of them are, you know, run on a shoestring budget, uh, overworked, overburdened, dealing with, you know, you know, pressing threats you know, that they right. view, you know, like someone who's sexually abusing patients, someone who's drunk in the operating room, someone who's, you know, selling, you know, prescriptions for narcotics, you know. Yeah, so it, but it's also their mandate to um, defend the standard of care. I mean, right. They just don't have the energy or budget left, and also I find the political will, really, right. to do right. much about that. Right. Harriet? Uh, I, I certainly agree with all of that, but CAM will always be with us. Quackery will always be with us because we have defective brains that uh, evolved to... Uh, I heard to, that. To, to, yeah, be, yeah. to be more, more like uh, Captain Kirk than Mr. Spock. And uh, people make decisions based on irrational and emotional factors, and we all do it. I, I certainly admit to it, and I, I doubt if there's anyone in this room that hasn't made a decision based on one of those things. And uh, you've got to be careful not to get uh, paternalistic or condescending when you try to protect people from themselves. So what I would like to see, ideally, is to have a reformed educational system where at every level of education, starting in preschool, uh, we were taught critical thinking skills. And, uh, <laughs> and then combined
combine that with ready availability of accurate information, and then if people choose to make poor decisions based on emotional and, and uh, illogical factors, um, it's informed consent. Okay, George, let's uh, start taking some questions. First question. All right, you've actually already touched on this a little bit, but um, uh, given the, the fact that there now seems to be maybe a substantial part of the population that might not seek out conventional treatments without some, uh, you know, whatever, com complementary or integrative medicine, what are the kind of ethical and, and moral dilemma, if any, in addressing those patients so that uh, if, if you're unwilling to use that, that you don't discourage them from, from getting the conventional treatment that may be necessary to, to treat. So what are the ethics of a, just as a physician, if your patient asks you, should I be taking this complementary and alternative medicine? Is that or I'm going to take it. Or I'm going to take it. Yeah, if they're telling us I'm taking, I'm going to a chiropractor, I'm taking the supplement. What do we do about that? David? Um, I, I mean, I'm, you, you have to be careful to do this and, you know, it is, respectful a way as possible, but you have to tell them the truth. You know, you have to tell them that the evidence doesn't support it or it, the problem is a lot of doctors don't actually know, you know, what the evidence is for a lot of these things. So, you know, I've had patients come up to me and say they wanted to try a Royal Rife machine, um, which, or various other things for their breast cancer. And I, I mean, I basically say, you know, I, there's no evidence that that works, um, and a lot of evidence to suggest that it shouldn't work, you know. But, I mean, you can't stop a patient from doing something like that. If they're going to do it, they're going to do it. All you can do is try to give them the information that would help make the decision. You know, patients have to be honest with their doctors, too, because I read a statistic that only 38% of CAM users had discussed it with their doctors. But the encouraging thing is that of all the people who are seeing CAM practitioners, 96% of them are also seeing a conventional doctor. And we should add, you know, part of the premise of that question was that it's very popular. The popularity is actually way overblown, and that's also an artifact of this broad category when you include things like anyone taking vitamins is using CAM. That's, that they inflates the statistics. But if you look at how many people have used like hardcore things like energy medicine, homeopathy, acupuncture, it's low single digits. Right. Yeah. So it's a lot smaller a phenomenon than they're really making it out to be. Again, that's part of the marketing. You create this wide umbrella and say, look, so many people are using it, you know, this part of it's legitimate, and then you just ride the pseudoscience in, you know, through the door. Okay. There are, um, my question is, there are a number of people who, at the grassroots, who would like to fight the misleading claims uh, that they see, you know, particularly in advertising and so forth, and, but they don't know how. Mm -hmm. And I know in the UK, they set up the uh, Nightingale Collaboration to provide the resources and guidelines for, for, for you know, ordinary folks like us to, to, to work with the appropriate governmental bodies. Uh, in order to do that. Do you know of any similar efforts being uh, pursued in the U.S.? I'm not yeah, nothing's, nothing that's similar to the Nightingale um, effort. <coughs> no. How about in the U.K., Rachel? Any, well, Friends of Science and Medicine is mainly about infiltration into academia. Yeah, well, there, there was also a, t um, a plug-in built for Chrome called Fish Barrel in the U.K., where you could just plug in a few things very quickly and it would very rapidly make a complaint to um, the regular, reg the, whoever was the, the regulation body. That doesn't actually work very well in Australia because our system is a little bit more complicated, but th there's a lot of people in Australia that just fill out the forms and complain and complain and complain, and we get called serial complainers by the CAM peeps, but you know, the thing is, if you abide by the rules, you won't get into trouble. It's as simple as that. But I, I, there are a couple of things like in the U.S. that any citizen can do. One is, I think the regulatory agency that is really trying their hardest to oppose a lot of the real fraud in the CAM is the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, because mm -hmm. a, lot of, a lot of them actually violate basic rules of commercial fraud. They're making claims that they're false not allowed to make, yeah. false advertising. So that's the thing that they're most vulnerable to. You try to get them on the standard of care, it's very squirrely and very deliberately squirrely, but, if they, but you get them on commercial fraud, false advertising, the FTC will absolutely go after them, and they're really making an effort to do so. So report them to the FTC. Also, get involved politically. Our politicians are listening to what they think 
you know, the public is saying, which is all being distorted by the CAM proponents. So, you know, make sure your representatives know that you want science-based medicine. You don't want the NCAM or you, know, you don't want laws that are going to water down the standard of care. In your state, too, this is, un unfortunately, this is mainly in the U.S. being fought state by state. So you really have to know about what's going on in your state. Well, hi. I have the uh, same question for this panel that I would have put to many of the speakers whom we have heard at the meeting. Namely, in this room, we are, you are, if you'll pardon the expression, preaching to the converted. How do you persuade, or why is it impossible to persuade the believers that they're wrong? Well, because they're convinced by their beliefs. You're never going to change the, the mind of people that are, that are believers because that they have a cognitive dissonance that pre predicts that they will believe that. I'm not trying to target the believers. There's no point, it's a waste of time. I try to target the fence sitters. And with respect to anti-vaccination, there's a, this is an estimation of about 20 to 30% of parents that are undecided. There's about 2% in Australia that are absolutely not gonna vaccinate. That 20 to 30%, their minds can be changed by things. So that's the people that you target. Forget about the believers, you'll never change their mind. Because of our defective brains, we are very susceptible to testimonials and advertising and uh, to personal experience. Uh, you, you take something for a cold and it's gone in seven days, so forever after you believe it cured your cold. <laughs> so yeah, I think it's worth pointing out that um, the, the evidence that we do have from surveys, et cetera, show that most CAM users are not hardcore true believers. Right. That's yeah. a very small core of true believers, you know, step 5% or so that are it's part of their worldview and they're really dedicated to it. Most are just open-minded to it because they hear about it in the press, they hear stories from their friends, and they're just grossly misinformed. So it actually is an area, and I find this with an individual patient, with my colleagues, with anyone, where just giving people accurate information has a huge effect. So we're actually confronting misinformation more than true believers in, in with this topic. Do you guys agree with that? Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Go back to the example of homeopathy again. Most people yeah. just think it's herbal medicine. Right. Um, you yeah, for know what it really yeah, is. For even most people. The, you know. yeah. yeah, for most people, all you gotta do is really tell them what homeopathy is and that's enough. Yeah. I heard a guy once say you should never use anecdotal evidence. <laughs> <laughs> I think I heard that same guy. <laughs> I think one of you alluded to this, but uh, it seems to me the big elephant in the room are the insurance companies that have either been compelled or allow CAM, uh, in, 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 you know, uh, for patients to, uh, uh, to use. Uh, related to that is, uh, in this country, we have a lot of uninsured people that, uh, what, what is the evidence that many of them are going to CAM folks uh, because they can't afford to go to a, a, a regular doctor. Right. So are the uninsured resorting to CAM because they can't afford medicine? I don't know of any statistics I, on that, Donna, honestly, to be honest with you. Do you know? I'm not I, aware I don't of know any statistics, but I've heard, certainly heard examples of people who couldn't afford medical care and found that CAM was cheaper. For instance, uh, there's a thing called red yeast rice that lowers cholesterol. And it works oh. because it has exactly the same ingredient in it as one of the prescription statins. But when you buy it as red yeast rice, uh, you don't have the guarantees that you have from a pharmaceutical. It's not regulated as carefully. Uh, you're not certain about the dosage. So my question was, why would anybody choose that over a prescription version? Because it's natural. And well, <laughs> that, but also people said, well, because I can afford it and the yeah. drugs cost a lot of money and I have to go to a doctor and pay the doctor to give me the prescription. And they, they've got a point. Right. The, the other part of this is that even the insured, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a, an effort by CAM proponents to try to get insurance companies and, yes, the government to uh, pay for this stuff. And insurance companies sometimes listen because if enough of their customers say, we want this covered, they, you know, they might just do it, you know. Right, right. They, they'll go for the cheaper thing. That's the insurance companies are okay with that. They don't care if it works sometimes. I've also had, you know, there were very, very specific rules where insurance companies I was dealing with had to write ridiculous regulations in order to accommodate uh, state mandates about what they're forced to cover. And they have to write regulations that affected me in this case because of 
that, but the laws were drafted to contain chiropractors that they were forced to cover for something that chiropractors shouldn't have been doing. It's a long story, but it was, the, that's the insanity that we're dealing with now, these ridiculous regulations that are being in, you know, forced upon insurance companies. That's the other sort of end of the spec, other right. aspect of this. It's another battle line that we're fighting, unfortunately. I wanted to come back to the question of playing by the rules, um, the idea that a lot of the alternative medicine, they don't want to do the hard work of the levels of clinical trials, process safety, purity, um, that, that pharma companies have to go through. And I'm wondering if um, our side is hurt by some of the abuses of the, the big pharma. We heard from Carol uh, Tavris yesterday, and there's many cases of Archangel has so, uh, shown. Um, does that, is that part of our problem, is, is that people say, well, look, uh, look, look what happens in the clinical trials. There's all these issues, problems, and they may not understand what's behind that, but then the alternative medicine can use that uh, to say this is why we don't need to go through uh, that process. Yeah, there was a recent case, and the, the big pharma company escapes me now, but there was a big expose very recently about some fraud that was going on. Was it GSK? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah, and that was actually, was. they had to pay a $3 billion fine for something evil that they did. And that was actually exposed by, um, partly exposed by scientists and skeptics. And so we're very happy to dob on ourselves and to expose fraud and, um, you know, bad behaviour when we see it. In fact, Ben Goldacre is one of the guys who does that all the time. Um, the difference is you'll never see that with alternative medicine practitioners. You know, even for example, the homeopath I mentioned before, who was implicated in the death of a woman from colon cancer, um, you didn't see the other homeopath saying that that's really bad, and what she did was wrong. It just doesn't happen, does it? Whereas right. science-based medicine, we're happy to expose that sort of stuff and say, look what we did, this is bad, let's move on from that now and learn from our mistakes. And you know, the other thing is you always get the old med people saying, but Vioxx, but thalidomide. Yeah, we learned from that and we're not gonna do that again because science is um, progressive and moves on from its mistakes and learns and moves forward. Right, but there's also there's a huge false dichotomy implicit in the question, which always to me is, reflects how successful their framing has been. Oh, look at big pharma versus big supplement or versus the, the cam world, but we're, all we're saying is we want one science-based standard to cover everything. We will, uh, we will criticize and attack the pharmaceutical industry when they abuse science and the, you know, the cam proponents when they abuse science. It's one science-based standard and these, any dichotomy or different, uh, that's their doing, that's their framing and it's specifically for the purpose of, again, carving out these double standards and, and, and invading they, the set. Yeah, yeah. If they want to play that card, Trini Tsideros just published an expose on the supplement industry, which right. is a big industry. Um, with a lot of overlap with, with pharma. With a lot of overlap with Big Pharma. Some of these companies are owned, owned by, by Big, big pharma, pharma, yeah. But who own them through various other companies, so it kind of high, obscures the connection. Yeah, they want to create this marketing image of a mom and pop, homegrown, supplement friendly, natural company, but it's, it's Big Pharma just selling supplements. Yeah, and because big of the homeopath, regulations are easy. Yeah. Big homeopaths make no money at all. They just yeah. do it for the love of it and the flowers and the unicorn farms. Yeah, boron, you know? yeah, they don't make a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> take a couple more questions. Hi. Um, I feel that the biggest problem here is money, obviously. Um, universities are turning to cans in order to bring in more money. And unfortunately, being a pharmacist, I've seen it happen in pharmacy, um, where we've had a lot of our funds cut, so we've had to you know, sell our souls to the devil and have these things in stores. And it's not necessarily the pharmacist's um, choice. How do you see us kind of going on from here and, and getting, getting the government to realise that, that they need to put money in into the right places um, so that we can actually treat our patients effectively and not give legitimacy to, to these products. Harry, I think, or, or Rich, go ahead, Rachel. I, I think someone mentioned this the other day, it wasn't here or maybe it was in a conversation I had, but we need to start making science and medicine and evidence-based medicine a political issue. So we have to go to the polls where um, we make an emphasis to our MPs that this is important to us so it, it becomes an issue where people vote for it. So, you know, there are lobby groups that um, will say, if you don't give us more childcare this election, we're not gonna vote for you. Um, it actually, sorry, it's in the Geek Manifesto, the new book by Mark Hampton, is it? It's the UK book called The Geek Manifesto. I, reckon, I recommend you read it. 
So it, I think we just need to coordinate ourselves better. And if we go through the political system and make it a voting issue where politicians go, I'm going to lose my seat if I don't represent these people, then we can start to get them to focus more money into these areas. Because at the moment, I guess, as, as you said before, David, there's too many shruggies. That's the problem. I'm, pes I'm pessimistic about uh, our politicians because so many of them are strong believers in alternative medicine. I mean, they they funded the NCCAM and the uh, Diet Supplement Health and Education Act, and uh, I, th I think we're, we're going to have to change society before we can change the politicians and change the laws. Right. But all it takes is one true believer and a hundred shruggies, right? That's what we're seeing. Yeah. Not, too not many hundred true believers. Right. Last question. Kind of, kind of related to her last question, I have noticed uh, you know, the increasing shelf space that the pharmacies have lent to uh, the CAM, outright CAM treatments or, or products that are, I strongly suspect are CAM but not sure about. Um, part one, what can somebody do who's standing in the moment looking for a product and they see them, the, the CAM, suspicious treat products right next to the legitimate ones, what, can they, what should they look for to uh, help them make the, the, a, a better choice, and uh, are there any efforts, or is there an effort that can be made to try and get, you know, let the pharmacies know that you don't want to see those those iffy products listed in the stores anymore? Well, you'd look straight for the Quack Miranda, wouldn't you, David? Wouldn't that be the oh, first the, thing? Oh, the Quack Miranda. Oh, yeah. The, uh, yeah. This product does not. Or we, it does not, or what is it? Does it's not, not been evaluated. The claims are, have not been evaluated by the FDA, basically. Right, uh, we do not claim to treat or diagnose any condition. <laughs> any disease. Like yeah. Or disease. Yeah, so yeah, if it has that, you know, basically disclaimer, that's it, that they're forced to put that on there because they, they hasn't been evidence to show that it works. Of course, if it says homeopathic run, right. you know, that's, that's, yeah. that's an easy one. I mean, that, that, yeah, that's a no-brainer. Yeah, and some of my friends have actually um, spoken to the pharmacist about it. Um, because in Australia, you quite often find ear candles on the counter at the pharmacy. And they've spoken to the pharmacist. And in some cases, the pharmacists have said, like Polly said, she's a pharmacist in Australia. Their hands are tied that they're put there by the people that own the pharmacies, not by the pharmacist. So the front of the shop often is the pharmacy guild that runs the business side, and the pharmacist has the back of the shop. So it's not there for... In some cases, the pharmacist says, yeah, but pa patients want them and they kind of work. And so it's an uphill battle. There's no single effort that you're aware of currently in existence to like like a grassroots thing in process because one person saying something to one pharmacist is one thing, but you get the ground Is there anything in in the works at the moment that someone could join in or nothing organized that I know of. I mean, obviously the things that individuals can do are guess complain to the pharmacist, write to the company, write to Walgreens or whatever, and say your but you have pseudoscience in your store, and I'm upset about that, and I'm not going to shop there anymore. If enough people do that you'll get their attention. I don't know what will happen, but... Yeah, I mean, the UK is doing it with boots and homeopathy. In yeah. Australia, we wrote to the pharmacists of Australia an open letter about three years ago and said, this is a joke, guys, come on. And we got a fairly good response. We didn't get a lot of stuff being taken out, but well, there's, there are coordinated efforts in the UK and, and Australia, so come on, guys. You guys have to yeah. do something. Expose <laughs> and shame. You know, yeah. it's, it's a, it's and we've got a great resource right in this room. Some of you guys out there, uh, get together, start a movement. <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much for your attention, everyone. Round of applause for our great panel.